Let's continue the, the fish and chip conversation. That's a, that's a nice uh, throwaway. <laughs> we just had. Arvid, so what is a traditional like German breakfast? Because mm. I feel like I've had plenty of German food, but I actually don't know what is a traditional breakfast. Got to be sausage, well, there's, right? th- there's two, two kinds of schools of thinking. There's uh, like the actual old German kind of breakfast, and then there's what Germans eat nowadays. Probably the same in, in, in Britain or in the States, right? There used to be a time before cereal, because cereal is an invention of like the, the 1930s or something. So there was a time where people actually just ate porridge and stuff every single day. But now everybody's eating cereal or, I don't know, like eggs and stuff. And it's the same here, right? Now people mm-hmm. here eat essentially, um, we call them Brötchen, which is like little buns, uh, white bread buns. Um, that is super, super um, popular. You get them at the bakery or you can have some that you bake uh, yourself in the oven. They're pre-made and like just frozen and you put them in there. And then with spreads, essentially like the, like the British, but less crazy. Kind of, you know, like we have a lot of sweet spreads, like uh, what would that be? Strawberry and uh, like marmalades, essentially. And you have mm-hmm. like a layer of butter and a layer of marmalade. But we don't go into curds. That, again, is a, a British thing, I guess, like the, the lemon curds and, and these kind of highly yeah. specific things, not, not German at all. Just a lot mm-hmm. of berry-based stuff. So that's what people would eat. Or maybe even um, a piece of ham, a piece of cheese, but on a bun, on like half a bun, that is hopefully still mm. warm and some and some coffee, maybe an egg, like a soft boiled egg. So that's the, mm. the, the current one. But there used to be a time where Germans would, like all the German foods, potatoes were involved. So you would have like a, just like roasted potato or pan fried potato with some like, some onion and some, some vegetables and stuff and maybe an egg mixed into this. And it's like an omelet, but really not. You know, it's just a really pan fried everything. And we call that uh, in German, it's Bauernfrühstück, which means a farmer's breakfast. So Mm -hmm. that used to be breakfast. Like really just get the leftover potatoes from last night, like cut them up, fry them up and put some egg on it. And that's German breakfast. Mm -hmm. So it was heavily vegetable based before Mm -hmm. we got into this mass producing buns and mass producing bread, which has kind of supplanted the traditional German breakfast. Mm. And uh, spe- so going back to spreads, because I know there's a, a big thing, like a big debate, I think, in the UK or something around, you're either like a, a Vegemite person or is it Marmite or not? You're either, you either love it or you hate it. And I don't know if that's like a, is that a thing? Is, is that still a thing? It's- we don't have it in Germany at all. So that's that's what I could quickly interject here. Only thing we have is Nutella, and that's what we swear by, you know, like a chocolate <laughs> hazelnut kind of spread. But Vegemite, the Marmite, don't have that here. So it's, I think it's in all of like the British colonies too. They took it everywhere. Yeah, it's it's, it's bov, Bovril and Marmite. That Marmite is the traditional one. Vegemite, for some reason, is more popular with Australians, but Vegemite does exist. Mm. But it's bo- mm. Bovril, Bovril and Marmite. Um, Yeast ex- e- yeast extract, basically, that's what it is. That's what it says on the mm. packaging. Yeast extract. I Incredible. it's delicious. Um, <laughs> Marmite is delicious. Um, <laughs> only on is toast. <laughs> only on toast. Some people drink it. That that is a step too far for me. But oh, it's funny. it's it's like salty. <laughs> Salty yeast. <laughs> That's like literally what it is. It's good. Salty it's good. brown. So I think yeast. we found our first sponsor for this show. We'll have to reach out to their. <laughs> hopefully, their team hears this. Bovril. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, do you have to get off at any particular time, Jamie? No. Okay. Yeah, I'm free. Cool. Well, so last time we talked about audience stuff, didn't we? So building an mm-hmm. audience, and. We decided that this time, by the way, I'm losing my voice today as well, so I'm not going to talk much. I've done about 50 presentations this week, and I've got no voice left. So, um, yeah, so we talked about audience stuff last time, and we thought it'd be cool to talk about, well, what do you do next after you've got an audience? And to some extent, that's charging for your work, right, isn't it? Or deciding... Deciding how you're going to do that. Are you going to sell a product on Gumroad? Are you going to make some kind of subscription? Are you going to make a course? Are you going to sell books like both of you have done? Basically, what do you do? And there's so many things to unpack on that. For I think the first place to start is probably the thing that feels closest to my heart is actually selling a thing in the first place and feeling guilty 
about doing it. Um, <laughs> how do you even get over that? Because that's what everybody's going to be feeling right now. Mm-hmm. Who wants to go first? <laughs> <laughs> I, well, I, I, I can try if, if you wanted go, to. Go ahead, Arvid, yeah. <laughs> I don't know where this guiltiness comes from, but I've been feeling it quite strongly all of, of like essentially for all of my digital entrepreneurial life. It's the kind of thing, I, I guess, particularly for me being from an engineering background, from like a professional trained, a digital professional background, it says oh, all this information is out there anyway. And uh, me regurgitating it in, in a different way is not valuable enough to actually warrant somebody paying me. That's just this, this kind of fear, the kind of mindset that is very limiting and uh, frankly, just wrong because all knowledge is built on other knowledge. And like the whole system of academia is built on making this tiny little improvement on something that hundreds, if not thousands of other very smart people have built their lives around figuring out, right? So saying that you have to be consistently original to create something that has value, I mean, it doesn't really work. And I, I think um, who was who was saying this recently? Um, it, it was a, a, one of these, these very, very interesting t- Twitter discussions about the imposter syndrome and uh, how people like lock themselves into this, this place where they think that only if they were to create something uniquely original would that be valuable to other people yeah and and that's i think where this fear is coming from and once you understand that you don't have to be original you just have to be helpful you have to provide something valuable to other people no matter who's already said it and maybe say it differently allowing for a different way of access to this information, then you can kind of just, yeah, expect people to find it so valuable that they can give you money. And once that is your mindset, once you see what I give is valuable and that value can be expressed in money, I think that makes it much easier to actually charge for it. Right. And and I always had this problem too with my blogs, uh, my blog posts and stuff, because I felt I was giving, 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 and I didn't really want to ask people for money because it was just every week was just a blog post, right? Is that valuable? But if you look at it over a year and there's 50 some blog posts, which essentially is a half a book, and then I write the other half, now all of a sudden it is valuable and it has been valuable the whole time, right? It just may not be as valuable as we consider it um, as a creative effort completely creative effort, but it is a, a, just an assortment of information that other people didn't have access to. And so I feel if we think about value, we should not com- confuse it with uniquely creative work alone, right? It is always part of what we do to be creative, but it's not the whole thing. Curation is just as important as creation. And in what we do, both of them together actually make stuff accessible. Because if you create something that is so uniquely new that nobody understands it, that nobody has access to it because it's just way out there, then that won't be valuable at all, even though it is highly creative, right? Which is the problem that every conceptual artist has that are so good at what they do, being a creative artist, but it doesn't connect with the reality of other people, that people just don't get it, and they don't want to pay for it. So it's somewhere in between. That's at least uh, how I just strategize it in my own mind. And that makes it much easier to actually charge for the products that I create. Mm. I think the thing that's helped me a lot is um, I, I feel like sometimes folks can have or feelings of imposter syndrome when they spend a weekend building something and then on a Monday launch it and, and begin selling. Um, I, I think part of the reason one might feel some imposter syndrome there is because uh, like, why me? Like, why would this be valuable? Like, so on and so forth. I, I, I don't know how long Arvid had been noodling on his first book. Um, but after spending a year of working on a book, I, I didn't feel guilty of putting it out there and selling it initially for four ninety nine on on an, an ebook version um, because I... I put so much time into it, effort and energy. So from my perspective, like the level of of time and effort invested into a project may give one a feeling of uh, kind of purpose and and feeling self-fulfilled. That's one thing. Um, When I I launched my newsletter initially, uh, 
July or August of, of last year, I initially had a paid component. It was free for the weekly newsletter. And I had like a very short daily digest. And my short daily digest was 250 words or less. And it was really just meant to inspire other creators to keep creating. It was kind of like my daily habit. Um, and, and I wanted to show others and bring them along for the journey of daily creation. But after about two months, I shut down my daily component. I shut down the paid component altogether because I felt like I wasn't giving my community enough value through that daily letter. And I was feeling a sense of imposter syndrome. Why would I charge someone $8 or $10 a month to access this daily letter when I wasn't really feeling like I was delivering enough value? Mm -hmm. So for me, this is not the only answer, but one of the answers to, my, to this question of, of imposter syndrome to me is, depending on how much effort you feel like you're putting into something and whether you feel like the value is returned through charging, paying customers for it, I think could be one thing. For me, that daily letter was not something I felt like I was delivering enough value to my audience. For my book, I, I certainly felt like it was a fair exchange of time and effort for the, the money I was charging. Um, so mm -hmm. that could be one thing. That is a super interesting point, though, because the book is a, an actual thing. Like, it's, it, it literally is a physical thing, if you want it to be, right? Like, if you, you can print it out, and then you have it, and you can hold it up and show your family, and they're super happy. Like, it is a manifestation of your work. Uh, a newsletter is not that physical. And the value of the newsletter is not necessarily in each daily episodes of the newsletter but in the continuation of that right the the consequence of the newsletter is the value of the newsletter not the newsletter itself and i feel this is so hard to correctly judge because what do you know right <laughs> about how this impacts other people particularly if they're too busy actually executing as a consequence of reading your newsletter to tell you that then your newsletter triggered them into executing. So it feels like th this whole community building thing is, is um, it's super valuable, but you don't really get to see it because the feedback loops aren't there for newsletters too. Like I send out a newsletter every week and I hope that people like it. And sometimes people send me a message telling me, this is really cool. And they read it every week. And they tell me this after they, they have been subscribers for months, right? And you don't know during this time, do people even read this? Even though I have like opening rates and all that, but it, it, this number doesn't translate into an actual meaningful result to me. Mm -hmm. So a book, you have a sale and the sale is the confirmation of the book. And then hopefully there's a review at some point too, where people tell you this is nice, but the sale is like the, the tangible part for a newsletter and any kind of ongoing concern, like a community or um, even, even a course, maybe, I don't know. The course also has a sale part, but it has a, like an extensive like actual, yeah, a time frame right there. So yeah. you don't really know. And unless you have these means of figuring out if people are actually deriving value from what you get, you might think, and I don't know how, how um, based in analytics your judgment was or if it was just a feeling. So I would like to ask you about this. So why did you, or how did you kind of decide that it wasn't giving enough value? Was it just a feeling or was it something that people told you? Uh, it, was, it, was more, it was more a feeling. Um, I, I, I unfortunately make a lot of decisions just based on feeling. Um, I can talk about that, but mm -hmm. I, um, uh, I, I wouldn't say it was uh, that, uh, a digital product, like a newsletter is not something that anyone could feel comfortable and confident selling and making good money on. And part of it for me is, I mean, I look at some of the most prolific newsletter creators out there and they're putting 40, 50, 60 hours a week into their newsletter. Mm -hmm. And I was putting more like five to eight hours. And so, um, there's, there's different balances. I think the point that I'm trying to, to make is, um, for me, like I put so much effort into the book. Uh, and so little effort into the newsletter that I, I, f I felt much more confident selling the book right. um, than putting a price tag on the newsletter. I, I, found mm. the, I found the same. I did exactly the same when I launched uh, the Daily Visual Community. It started as a monthly subscription. It was, I think it was $9 a month. And I, I kept the subscription going for one or two months. And I kind of felt like I wasn't providing the value of what if I thought it was worth. So I canceled everybody's subscriptions and let them stay and said, I'm switching the pricing model. So I switched the pricing model to uh, like a cohort based thing. You join every month, you know, you join one month 
and then you get access to the community permanently, basically. Mm-hmm. And that that was all based on a on a feel for me as well. I I just felt personally that I uh, that the it wasn't worth the money. It wasn't worth nine dollars a month. So that that's what I said. Even though people were telling me it was, I just mm-hmm. felt in my exchange, it felt like I was exchanging uh, too little for the amount of money that they were paying me. So I wanted to change the situation. And another point I want to make as well, which is sideways to this, is is the whole selling digital products things. In 2020, that was the first time I'd ever sold a digital product. And I, I was racked with guilt for, for months of deciding to sell my first one, which was uh, an ebook that I'd written a couple of years previously. And I didn't want to sell it because I thought, who's going to buy it? And what ultimately my attitude came to be now that I've, I've made quite a few Gumroad products and digital products was that before I used to think, who am I to sell this? But now my attitude is much more, who am I not to sell this? Who am I to say that it's, it's not, right for you to buy it if you you know if, if you buy it you've obviously thought you've got value from it so that that exchange there is good enough for me so that now i'm not so bothered about selling things if nobody buys it fine that's proof that it doesn't work if one person buys it that surely that's proof that there is value in me selling it um i feel much less guilty about it but i did feel exactly the same way uh, that Jamie did with, with my community that I, it, it was for some reason I wasn't providing enough value. That That is so interesting because I'm right there at this moment before opening a community because I'm thinking about that too, right? I have a lot of people that are interested in entrepreneurship and like building an audience first and audience driven business that I I think like, obviously there's some way for me to turn this into a community that I could probably get like um, monetized with um, through access, like again, charging 10 bucks a month or something. And I'm also wondering, can I provide enough um, value to this community? And the thing is, I don't really have much else to do other than like writing a book and like being on Twitter way too much. So I could potentially, spend a lot of time in this community, but I feel like even that probably wouldn't be enough. And I do think that is, that that is a limiting belief. I know I kind of sense that this is a limiting belief, but it's there for a reason. And it's interesting to see it in in both your cases as well, that this kind of, I'm not doing enough is always there. So I wonder if this is just, again, another kind of variant of imposter syndrome, or if there's like an underlying actual problem to communities, monetizing communities where you are supposed to be the one kind of leading or encouraging or like filling it with content. Like maybe, maybe Craig, the question that I have for you in this case, do you think you could have turned this into something worth nine bucks a month with more time or more effort or whatever? Or is it just something that you thought you could never accomplish? Uh, I actually think on reflection, I was definitely providing nine bucks a month of value because it's barely nothing, really. Mm -hmm. There was weekly office hours every week. I was providing feedback and everybody's visuals. I was in there trying to drive the community. I was providing the feedback. But there was just, there was just something in the back of my mind that said this either wasn't enough or maybe it was that I didn't want to build the community that way. I didn't want to lock myself into the fact that yeah. I had to be there all the time. This is the the limiting thing I think of communities in mm-hmm. the way that I, I was starting to do it, that I knew I was building a prison for myself, that I was going to have to be expected to be active in the community constantly. I haven't worked Thanks that. for voicing this. I yeah. feel the exact same way and I don't even have one, you know, yeah. like it's, it's in, in my mind. I already feel, Oh my God, this has to like, if people get a yearly subscription that locks me in for a year of daily, like activity, yeah. showing up, organizing, doing stuff. And as much as I like the work, like the field in which I work, that organizing stuff might not be for me. At least that's, that's what my mind is kind of subtly telling me. Um, interesting to hear you feeling that as well. I think one thing that's interesting to think about is rather than the $9 a month uh, being uh, something that you, you charge your customer, thinking of it more as like a filtering mechanism 
mm-hmm. to bring the right people yeah. into the community. And so you throw up a landing page and you market your community in the right way. You charge the right amount. It's going to attract the right people. And mm-hmm. you being that lighthouse or magnet to attracting those people into that community, if it's marketed well, if it's priced at the right price point, you're filtering in the right community members into that group. Point. And, uh, very and good so I, I think, I think like the self-limiting belief here is interesting because I was a part of a, a writing group. It was uh, $10 a month for, uh, and, and I was a part of that community for almost six months. And it was one of my favorite communities. There were only a hundred of us in there. It was very small, um, but it was one of my favorite communities because of the size of it. Um, yet the founders of that community felt like they weren't offering enough value every single week. And, uh, and, and so they closed it down after six months. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, like being a community member there, I loved that group. Um, I love that group. And so I think being on both sides of it, like as a community member, like being willing to pay $10 a month, even if all I'm doing is joining like one office hour every couple of weeks Mm -hmm. or something else, I I still feel like I'm a part of that community and I get value out of it. And so as long as there are paying community members there, uh, you know, anyone can cancel their monthly subscription at any point in time. That's their decision right? That's not something that you're responsible for. That's, that's in their court. And so I I think it's interesting. I still, uh, being a member and community member of visualized value still feel like I get a ton of value out of being there and around that community, even though I no longer attend the office hours, even though I no longer am very active in their Slack and circle channels and so forth. Um, at any point I can cancel my subscription right? That's, that's a decision I can make. So I think it's interesting uh, Mm -hmm. thinking about this more as a filtering mechanism to find the right community members rather than thinking of it like, well, how am I going to deliver $10 a month because of value, because um, that, that value is different to everyone. I think it's, it's a really important point. And that was actually why I put the price tag on it in the first place, because for for a filtering, filtering mechanism. And then retrospectively, I, I thought that I wasn't providing enough value. I didn't want a free community, basically, because I knew everybody would join. I wanted, I limited it to 25 people paying $9 a month, and that's all I wanted. I wanted a close-knit group of people. And then when I, I got the close-knit group of people, I, I felt guilty charging them $9, $9 a month for what I thought was was not worth it. But they were still paying it. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? It's ridiculous. Like, it is. It's ridiculous. But I, I don't, I know. I think Netflix and, and all these 10 bucks a month services, they, they are def- definitely doing something to our entrepreneurial minds. Like just on, on a sense of, okay, this is the price point we're competing with our solution for, right? 10, 10 bucks a month, 10 bucks a month here, 10 bucks a month there, same price, completely different product, obviously completely different market and completely different unit economics and all that kind of stuff. But you see the 10 bucks here, you see the 10 bucks there, and then you kind of think that you have to try to provide as much value per dollar that Netflix, a company that's worth billions with thousands of engineers and all that stuff is providing to a a B2C audience where you are like very deeply in a B2B kind of founder to founder market. So it's probably our inability to see the difference between the whole ecosystem around this $10 and the ecosystem around our $10. And it's just slowly seeps into our minds. I couldn't explain it otherwise, right? We, we yeah. obviously all know that there is value in these communities. Like Craig just said that people kept paying and there is no better way of judging value than actually continuously receiving a recurring payment, right? If there is value still and people think it's still worth it, they do not cancel. And if they don't cancel, you can imply that the value is at least as much as the month before. Otherwise, mm-hmm. people, you know, they quickly cancel if stuff doesn't work for them. So um, maybe that's the confusion. The underlying confusion is that this this price point um, illusion that we have, that we have to be as good as whatever $10 gives people in value as, as another subscription. Yeah. 
Yeah, may, maybe that is it. I think there's there's a further thing to it as well. Jamie's point about um, using money as kind of uh, a way to filter people out. I think that's a, a really important way of looking at it, and that's what I often think about when I'm um, when I'm making digital products. I could make it free. Mm-hmm. You know, is it it is a digital product? Other than my time, there wasn't there isn't any ongoing costs, so I could make it free. But there's there's a certain point where you where you flip, where you remember when you charge some when you don't charge anything when it's free, people download it and don't use it. But when they mm-hmm. pay you for it, they finally this is the filtering mechanism. They finally go away and consume it and use it. So I think it's it's an important point to see the money on the other side of it as well when you charge the money and that can be anything a ridiculously high price or a small price that actually gets people to take action with the product as well which i think is important Mm -hmm. yeah one of the models that i think is is executed very effectively is what dickie bush is accomplishing with ship 30 for 30 and it was a part of cohort number one and I think Dickey, before cohort one started, was wrestling with this idea of whether or not I should charge people to join this community. All he wanted to do was help people develop a daily writing habit. Um, But a couple of days before the community or the cohort launched, he said to everyone, hey, guys, I made the decision. We're going to do, I think it was $99 or something like that for the month. And if you complete the 30-day challenge, I'm going to return that money back to you. (laughs) <laughs> and if you don't, we're going to donate it to a charity of choice. And, and I think as far as like becoming an even additional accountability buddy, that $99 was always kind of in the back of your head. Um, and so I, I think there's a lot of interesting ways that you can use money in community. Um, it doesn't have to be necessarily going to Craig or Arvid or Jamie, um, but different ways that money can also be used as accountability. There's definitely something to be said to when somebody pays you more money, they expect less from you personally. Um, the the way I'm framing this is if you're charging for a service or something, I run a design agency. If you charge them $5, they expect the earth. If you charge them $5,000, they're actually just a nice person and they respect your expertise and so on and so forth. The same is true with products, right? You You charge free. You end up providing technical support for everything permanently, and you make you make nothing from it. Yeah, the the, the expectation level of like bottom feeder products um, that that just by mere mm. competition have been like driving prices down and the expectations of people up because you know competition is ruthless in the particular products. Yeah, if you transplant that onto digital products, you you're gonna have a problem <laughs> definitely. Um, what, what do you also, think? Go ahead. I was just going to ask a, another follow-up question about, I, I know this is something I wrestled with when I first started making Gumroad products, is what do you think about charging, so say you're releasing a digital book on Gumroad, what do you think about charging $40 for that or $50 when, if it's on Amazon, it'd probably be $4.99 or something like that. But <laughs> what, what do you think about doing that? I've got a well, one, one, one really interesting thing, uh, especially about the corner of the internet that we play around in is you're not just buying a book. You're also able to have direct access to that book's creator. And so any author that is available on Amazon is not always easy to access. Um, and, and I think what the way that I was thinking about building online in the very, very early days um, is I was thinking to myself, like, whatever I create, I want to be the most accessible creator of whatever that was. That is going to be my competitive advantage, so to say. So if, for example, I were to, which I'm not going to do, but if I were to build a micro SaaS product that, um, that made your, that organized your email inbox better. Like no matter what, I would want to be the most accessible person that did that. 
And anyone could reach out to me anytime on Twitter. And I, I thought to me, at least at, the, at a minimum, that would be my competitive advantage. Now, I don't know if that scales over time, um, but I, I certainly thought in the earliest days of my creator career, like I would just be accessible. Um, and so I think that definitely separates Gumroad writers from anyone that's producing a book and doing a big book tour and hitting the number one New York Times bestseller list. Like anyone writing a book on Gumroad is, is typically able to be accessible if they want to. So it's got built-in tech support then. That, that's to some extent why the book's more expensive. What do you yeah, think? Yeah, and I don't really like that phrase much because like, I also think like if someone reaches out to you and they're like, man, your, your, book, your info product you sold like really changed my life. Like I would be like, well, let's set up a call. Let's talk about it. Like naturally, that's just like my human reaction. And so I, I think like, you, you don't get that with your uh, Adam Grant or Cal Newport or J- I mean, James Clear, right? Like yeah. the, they, they, they're surrounded by a lot of people like all the time. Yeah. How do they filter? Um, how do they filter through the noise? And I, I think as a, an early stage creator, someone that's building info products or books on Gumroad, like that's one of your advantages is, is you can be there for your readers. I think I should have probably clarified as well. I, I wasn't literally meaning, you I know, know, I know, I know, you know, like a, a novel or something, charging forty dollars for it on Gumroad and then charging five dollars on Amazon. I meant an info product type thing. Like I'm working on one at the minute. It is in a book format, but it's a it's a reference guide really, and I'm not charging five dollars. I, I think it's thirty dollars or something like that, because it's got. I, I see it's got more value. That was the point. I was kind of making, which you got anyway. What do you think, Arvid? Well, there's there's also the the whole who are you selling it to part, right? Mm. Which is the thing that you will never know on Amazon. Like whatever you sell on Amazon, you're going to sell it to the void. You don't know who you're selling your books to. You're never going to get an email address. You won't even get demographics. You just won't. You just <laughs> don't know. But if you if you sell it on Gumroad, you you get much more insight. Then you get email addresses, and you can kind of figure out what segment of your market you're selling to. And whenever you say forty dollars info product, I immediately think of Daniel Vassalo's book on AWS stuff and the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he made from that yeah. and the hundreds um, and thousands of connections that he's built with people who've consumed his book and now invited them into a private monetized community where he shares how he makes money and other people get to imitate, learn from, and all that kind of stuff, right? It's genius. It's the ultimate flywheel. He has a super high expensive product that only people who are professionals in this industry can af- and will afford, and then has a direct link because Gumroad, like you said, ha- gives you access to the email of this person. And you can infer a lot of data and information from the email address of, or just a, a bunch of email addresses in a field alone, right? You, there are probably services out there where you just throw in a couple of emails and they tell you which income segment of the population they are from because there's you know all this data out there. I would assume, I don't know, probably a good idea for SaaS, doesn't matter. Um, Facebook does Not it. another SaaS idea midstream, we won't have that. <laughs> Facebook does you know, it. Like, yeah, yeah, there, there's, there's um, this information is out there and you understand like who you're selling to. And obviously people who have interest in AWS literature are advanced or likely advanced programmers or people working in the IT field mm. and building a relationship with them and the ones in there that may have a six figure income, but want to be a, a solo founder making their own money and then joining your community to learn that. It's just, it's just a genius path, right? The info product is just almost itself a filtering mechanism to get yeah. access to people who would then be even more monetizable, if you think about it, which yeah. is kind of genius. Got to hand it to him. You right? know what I also think is interesting too is I, I think when you build products for creators in the creator economy, you are reaching people that sort of like understand that I cannot reach out to this person for tech support all the time. Like yeah. I'm a creator. I wouldn't want someone to do that to me. Yeah. Why would I do that to someone else? I, I think it's really cool. Like people are very, people are very mindful of, of one another's time uh, in our, in the community. And, and I think, I think it's a result of everyone being able to put one another in one another's shoes. Um, and so I don't know. I, I think when you create an info product for a creator, you're, 
not just like attracting the right reader, but you're also attracting like a, think of that person, like think of that persona on the other side too. Um, you know, they're, they're busy. They're trying to figure things out. Like those are, those are the readers we have. I think yeah, and they are entrepreneurial enough to understand that there is value in something dense and condensed to consume to quickly learn a lot of stuff, right? Yeah. Like they know that spending 10 or 20 or 30 bucks now on this product will save them from having to spend hours and days of learning it by themselves. Like they value that time. They actually have a dollar value for that time. And it's easy to be under that dollar value because these are hopefully or very likely high, high charging, highly paid professionals. Ma yeah. many or most of them. So probably a reason why you could charge that high is that it's still under the limit for their budget comparing that time to uh, the money that they have and could spend on info products. I, I was going to say the thing about condensed versus dense, I, I, the exact mm -hmm. thing about a Gumroad product, just because the price is a certain point, it doesn't mean it has to be 300 pages long or whatever. Mm -hmm. I've, I bought a product a while ago, a writing product, which was $100, it, it was pretty much a cheat sheet, a one-page mm -hmm. cheat sheet with some video guides. It wasn't a long thing at all, but I got the enlightenment that I needed. I got one tip out of that that I'd been missing, and it, it, it changed how I was writing forever. And that is really all you need in that thing. And people will value that kind of situation more wow. than they would value you making a 300 page book on how to write because I wouldn't have got through the book, but the, the single insight that I needed that I knew I wanted was in there and very easy to find. So don't necessarily tie the value to the size of the product yeah. either. That's interesting. You know, coming back, I'm going to connect a couple of dots for just a moment, like coming back to that Netflix analogy, like we pay $10 a month to Netflix so we can sit on our couch and eat popcorn, right? Versus potentially an info product that could change your entire career trajectory. Yeah. Like that's really interesting to think about. Um, another interesting thing is, um, oh, it's going to slip my mind, but I, I think that's really interesting, Craig. Yeah, well, I, I just thought about it then because I know I and others this is the thing that a lot of people worry about. They think that they've, the thing that they've got that they want to sell isn't good enough, basically. And and the usually the way that they say it isn't good enough is because it isn't a big thing or it isn't long or, or anything like that. But the, the beauty of making a product, a digital product, one, you can make as many of them as you want. This product that you're making right now is not going to be the most, the last thing you ever make. So even if this one's a bit crappy or nobody buys it, it doesn't matter. You can just delete it and make another one or leave it there. And and then the other point I wanted to make is is that you can you can sell it and see what happens. You can change the price later on, up or down. None of this is fixed. Um, you, the the biggest challenge I think we'll all agree is getting over your own self to actually think I have value and the things I say have value and I'm going to sell, sell it. That's the hardest thing. Well, the, there used to be, and this still is, this industry called publishing, you know? <laughs> and I, I have this this feeling that um, with gatekeepers vanishing in many, many different places, right? You have it in podcasting, which is essentially radio. If you uh, are uh, a bit older than 30, then you will remember that. And you you have the publishing as a, as a construct to funnel knowledge into paper, stacks of paper that are sitting in a shelf. Yes. Right? And the publishing industry is all about selling their paper. It's not about selling the knowledge. So you have this middleman in there that is interested in telling you, can you write more so our paper is a bit thicker and looks bigger than other pieces of paper on a shelf? <laughs> and that the, the back of the spine of the book is more pronounced. So people will look at it in the shelves. Like, honestly, I, I heard a, a little workshop that um, April Dunford did in, in Rob Fitzpatrick's writing community. 
Yes, all, all of these authors, like that, we we're all kind of connected. She did it the week after I had a little workshop in his community. It was a lot of fun. And she did say this about her book, Obviously Awesome, that she went to a publisher with. And they stayed, they looked at it and said, well, isn't there already a book on positioning? Um, can't you write something else? Like these people in the publishing business, they have no idea what a good info product is. But they certainly know, oh, this is too small. You can make it bigger. Because for them, people buying books is actually real human beings going into a bookstore just randomly by chance standing in, in front of the aisles browsing the spines of the books for something that they want to read yeah. that is how people in the publishing industry at least to, to a, a large extent still understand the purchasing behavior of people and our precision targeting that we do with our products like i sell zero to sold my book to people who are literally at the zero part who are entrepreneurial but not yet entrepreneurs or people who just started and want to get some guidance on how to make it make sense of all these different things. Those are the people I want to sell to. That's why my book is not in bookstores. I think I've never seen it anywhere, but I also haven't left my home for a year. So who knows, but it's, it doesn't have to be because I'm not trying to reach the people who mindlessly stroll around the bookstore and just look for the biggest spine for some reason to buy, right? The people that I want to sell to are people that are precisely at this point in their entrepreneurial career. And they have 10 bucks to spare and they yeah. want to learn something that I learned in many, many years in a day or two. That's my yeah. audience. That's super specific. And the publishing industry is, doesn't care about super specific. They want to print hundreds of thousands of these books, put them into the stores and hope that lots of random zombies walk by and just pick it because it has a nice spine. So the disconnect between the existing industry and what we can do now, self-publishing digital books on Gumroad, like within a day, you could literally have an idea, flesh it out in the morning, slap on a cover in the afternoon, sell it at night, wake up to a couple hundred sales. Like that does not exist in the traditional world. It's not supposed to exist because there's this whole chain of logistics in there between editing, proofreading, um, like designing the book, designing the covers and building the actual physical thing, like printing it and delivering it into stores, selling it, marketing, all this stuff doesn't have to happen for a digital product. And I think to actually make a point now, this kind of chain of events and the kind of, oh, these people are professional, they know what they're doing. This sense um, of they approve of what you do as a writer if they take your book and put it into a stores. This external approval mm. is something we don't get as self-published people. The ex external approval that we get is through the actual sales on Gumroad or through the people talking about a product, which is much more direct, but we have to go look for it. We have to make it happen. Right? We can't just hand it over to somebody. I've written my manuscript. Now turn it into a magical book and sell it to everybody on earth. That's not going to happen. So there's still a lot more to do after the actual creation process. And that's something that many people don't really know. And there's no external approval other than actually doing the thing, putting it there on Gumroad and selling it. I, I want, that's scary, right? Yeah. I want to link this to audience as well, because you, you said a thing about niche and specific, uh, specificity, that word I can't say. Um, basically you've got a very specific audience. We can take this a step further as well, which is this is where this is really exciting. All three of us could write the same book and there would be a market for all three of those books because mm -hmm. people who follow us on Twitter are different people who would want to see our perspective. So we don't have to worry that like going back to the beginning that these mm -hmm. things have been said before or anything because we have our own perspective on these things and people are interested to hear our voice on them as well so the, the there is no comparison to the publishing industry at all we mm -hmm. we could write the same things well not the same things but the same things in our voice and there'd still be a market for it that's what makes it so exciting as well yeah and, and it won't like sell hundreds of thousands of copies like un unlike you, uh, and unless you, you built this amazing book that like one in a million book that everybody wants to read. And I'm thinking about James Clear here, like this yeah. kind of trajectory that you write something so relatable to both the initial audience to write it for and the larger, ev almost everybody out there, or maybe it was on purpose that he wrote it for everybody. It's, it's, it's a great book, right? Like Atomic Habits is an amazing book because it like brings brings out this, this central point, central problem that everybody has. 
with, you know, like habits and all that stuff. But you don't have to. Like, you don't have to sell hundreds of thousands of books. Like, again, Rob Fitzpatrick, um, I've been talking to him a lot because I'm in this writing community as well. And it's it's super interesting to see how he approaches this. Like, he wrote The Mom Test, a book that every person that has something to do with, with product um, management or customer development, customer exploration should be reading or should have read. And it's a really thin book. It's like 120, 150 pages. And he sells it initially sold it also for a lot of money, went down a bit, and then it found some adoption. And now it's in a really good spot for him. He, I think he makes a five figure monthly income from that, that book sales alone in electronic um, as an ebook and as a paperback. And that is the goal to me, at least that, that is my goal with the book. I don't want this to sell hundreds of thousands of copies. I don't want this to be the number one bestseller book on any weird newspapers, old fashioned bestselling list. I, Seth Godin had a very interesting episode on that one, like the, the New York times bestseller list and how pointless that is. Right. It's uh, don't, I don't want to dive into that. I'm not going to go there, but I don't want my book to be there. I want my book to be read by entrepreneurs that actually can derive value from that and not for people who read, read a newspaper. Right. So selling enough of the book to sustain my life is all that I want to do. Like, honestly, I don't have higher goals than that with this particular product or the amount of books that I will write in the future. Doesn't have to be a bestseller. It just has to be something that helps people that I want to help. And I think that aspiration makes the book so much more targetable too, because I do not need to write it for everybody who has ever thought about business. I need to write it for people who are at this point that they're interested enough in learning how to build a SaaS. And that is already so much more specific than, I don't know, like my, uh, my, my, my grandma's friend who thought that in her old age, she could still do something with pottery, maybe as a business, like something that is just a feeling, a general vibe of entrepreneurship. I don't write for these, these people particularly. I write for the ones who have a much more specific goal. And that's enough for me because I know there's enough people out there. Like, obviously, there's millions of these people in the world that I could sell my product to. It doesn't have to be billions of people. Why should it be? Right. And, and that makes such a big difference for us because we can target much clearer. And I think our conversion rates when people come to our Gumroad pages with our products are much higher than the conversion rates of any, any kind of fiction writer on Amazon. People say, ah, no, <laughs> next, you know? Like, but when they see our faces, because we have built a community around ourselves, when they see the actual like laser targeted topic of the books, the likelihood of them actually looking into this and purchasing it is so much higher than just walking, uh, I'm sorry for like stressing this metaphor, but walking into the bookstore, looking at the spines for something interesting without having a purpose. People go to the Scumroad page on purpose because it's linked somewhere where they care about it. Right? where people actually curated this link and say, this is good for you. Click on this. And then they come there and then they purchase. I think that's ultimately what it's about, isn't it, Jamie, that we're making products that people are going to use, right? Useful stuff. Yeah, I wrote this the other day that like the most successful creators give away all of their best ideas for free and then package them up in a way that no one else has done before mm -hmm. and yeah. sell that. That's how they make money. And I, I think that's really, really true. Like for me, uh, I, I want to be accessible. I want to be constantly sharing ideas. I want that to be what attracts people to my content. And then once a year or once every two or three years, I can release a product uh, that enables me to monetize that audience in a, in a new and unique way that hopefully provides them with a sense of value. And so I, I think one of the things that I'm really interested in next is like put out this book and started to slowly um, see how uh, one product can like lay the foundation for many more and trying to like chart the next steps is always a really interesting and exciting thing. Um, but I'm not trying to release anything in the next six or eight or 12 months. I'm trying to enjoy this, this moment of having my first product out there in the market. Um, Tim Ferriss has this really interesting quote um, around how like he knows that he could sell hundreds of products to his audience. It's large, it's huge. And people have tons of affinity for him, but he says 
my audience is smart. Why would I milk them for every dollar that they have? Yeah. It may repel many from me. Um, so, so I really love Arvid's, Arvid's thought or idea there. Every, every creator should have sort of a North star. And I, I don't know what Arvid's is, but having that idea of like being able to earn five figures a month from one product being the Holy grail, like that is, that would be incredible. Um, or being able to earn five figures a month from a combination of two or three products would be incredible. Yeah. Um, set, trying to figure out what your, what your product mix is. I think of it like a menu, <laughs> like what are the products that are on my menu at a restaurant? You know, like what does my menu look like? Um, and, and how can I get to that point where I can separate my income entirely from like what I might be earning in my nine to five on my W2 and be able to transition completely to uh, working for myself. Mm. I think a good place to finish would be to ask this question. So probably most people who are going to listen to this won't have made a product or they, they'll have made a free product or something like that. And they'll be in the situation right now that we described at the beginning of the anxiety of how much do I charge? Do I charge a dollar? Do I, do I charge $500? Do I charge 50? They, they'll be procrastinating for some reason on selling a thing because they'll be afraid of it. What would you say to them to actually get them over the line to actually start selling their first product? Go on, Arvid. <laughs> Oh, sorry, Jamie, it looked like you had something to say then. Yeah, it looks like he does. Well, cool. I, for me, I, I mean, make something, it, you, you will feel much more comfortable and confident if you make something that's personal. Mm. The, my, my opinion, so Arvid's book, v- very, very personal. It's about all of the 10 years of experience that he has had combined into a massive anthology, right? My book is a combination of five or six stories from five people that have had a huge effect on me. And I, I share their journey. Um, I, I, I think there are hundreds of eBooks out there on Gumroad about how to get your first thousand followers on Twitter. Now I, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not someone that's going to probably go purchase a product like that, but you could take something that has been done hundreds and hundreds of times and personalize it in a really different way. You could create a very different ebook about how you went from zero to a thousand followers. Don't copy someone else's zero to a thousand follower ebook. Don't do X, Y, and Z. Create something that's highly personal. Create something that's very original. Some in in a structure that no one's ever created it before. Or uh, combining different mediums in a way no one's ever done before. Do something that's different. Do something that's true and original to yourself. And if you can't figure out what that is, keep noodling on it. (laughs) Like that is the the most reflective process we can all do is try and figure out like who we are and what makes us really original. And by doing that, rather than copying, like doing that work, we will give ourselves the ability to design our own trajectory that we can build on step after step after step. So yeah, my, my advice is make it personal. Um, that that will make you feel like you've put something out into the world that's, you know, not just trying to get five dollars for an ebook, but five dollars for an ebook that's never been done before. That's you. I yeah. really like this because to, to, to me this describes this intersection of of curation and creation, right? Like obviously you won't be able to break out with something that is like the most original thing ever written, but if you make it about your learning journey your understanding of how you got to a certain place, either that's getting followers or finding a job or finishing a project, creating a project, starting, failing at a project, doesn't really matter, right? It doesn't have to be this kind of success story. It could just be an actual story of overcoming or failing at a certain thing. Just as long as it's personal and full of the insights that you found along the way, it's valuable. And that is, um, if you spice that up with stories that you found on other people or by other people that ha- went through the same journey, maybe went through it differently with a different outcome or with a different goal even, if you can condense this into something meaningful that comes, and that's that's what you just said, but I, I really like this approach. It comes from your personal perspective. It's like your little vision 
onto this thing that is out there for everybody else to see. Like if somebody else were to do the research, they would find the same information, but they would look at it through a different lens. And that lens is the valuable thing because that lens is your filtering mechanism, your outlook on the world and your perspective on how to tackle growth, how to tackle success, how to tackle anxiety, fear, all these things that these are part of your perspective. And that's the stuff that people actually want to learn about. Right. Everybody can look at, at the next 10 growth tips, the next growth hacks for a business. So there are enough resources out there to quickly find this, but they're completely meaningless if you're, if you're just looking at them from a neutral perspective. You have to look at it from, from a personal perspective. And the more personal perspectives you get to see, the better you will be at judging these kind of things. So mixing this kind of your personal creative perspective and the curation of information that is out there is a great start into building a meaningful digital product. That's what I would suggest. Because honestly, that's all I've been doing in all of my writing is to look at stuff that other people have an opinion on and kind of put my own opinion, my twist on that opinion, or just give my own perspective, my experience, or just my thoughts on certain subjects, right? I have a lot of experience in some fields. I have little experience in others, but I do have an opinion that is rooted in experience somewhere. And that is my perspective, my unique perspective. And that is something that everybody has even though you may feel that you don't have enough experience or you don't have the right to talk about this, just consider that there's always somebody out there that is just slightly behind you in their own entrepreneurial journey, right? There's a lot of people behind you. There's a lot of people ahead of you. Doesn't matter. You're building for this person just slightly behind you who needs that little next step to get to where you are. And you can be a beginner, but a couple months into learning how to code, you can already start teaching people how to approach learning how to code because you've already taken those steps that other people might be afraid of. They don't know where to go first. They don't know what options are out there. Doesn't matter, right? There's always somebody slightly behind you. And if you start serving these people, you will move ahead. They will move ahead. And then a year from now, you're going to be much further ahead and you could teach many, many more people who are behind you at all these different stages because you've went through all of them and you understand the needs, the explicit needs of all these people at all these stages. So it is, it's a path, like building info products is a path. And I, I've built one info product in the past. I'm building my second one right now, which is a reflection of the learnings from building that product and building my audience, building a brand. And now I put all of this into the second product. Who knows what the third one is going to be looking back at the second and its success or failure, who knows, but it is a journey and I'm, gladly going along the journey, knowing that I can help those people slightly behind me or quite a bit behind me, a couple of years, maybe still fine. Like everybody has, is at, is at a different sp space, a different space and time on their journey. And if you, if you understand that, then you can build for them and you, you will always find something to help these people. We just have to essentially talk about how you found your way to where you are right now. One, one thing uh, that I think is super valuable, um, I can't wait to go back to my parents' house, is uh, pictures. Uh, I, I'm really interested in combining like photos of, of me growing up into my future content. Um, the more and more personal we can make our our creations, the better. When you are in this creator economy, not when you are trying to put a book on a shelf at a bookstore and be the one that everyone picks up and, and buys, but no, in this new creator economy, making it very personal is, is very, very important because people are buying you for you. Like that's why they're doing it. And so I, I think I, I, I really am looking forward to like integrating more personal photography or personal stories or, um, or personal like, experiences that I have had in my past uh, into my creations in the future, because that's what makes anything unique. Um, when you want to build a, a moat around yourself as a creator, well, there's no better moat that you can build than like integrating things that no one else can take from you. <laughs> And my baby photos and my childhood photos and <laughs> my experiences growing up and those stories of me trying to figure out life, those are things that no one else has had, yeah. but they can relate to. And so um, uh, David Perel has this framework. He calls it pop. 
make it personal, observational, and playful. And, and I think all of those are really important components, but for anyone that's building their first info product, if you can really nail that personal piece, um, I think you're going to be on a good path. I think, yeah, that's a perfect way to wrap it up. Make it personal. Use, use your childhood photos in any product that you're going to use going forward. <laughs> and, uh, indiscriminately, indiscriminately. Just, yeah, just, just use them everywhere. On everything. Yeah, I'm just going to use them. I'm going to find mine. I like the idea though. That, that is, is something that you know, the ultimate mode because nobody yeah. can steal your past and unless there's clones and stuff that can, uh, not even them, right? Yeah, it's, that's that's really cool. Well, that's like that. that's the thing we're getting across, isn't it? A lot of people forget their past when they try to make a product because they think mm-hmm. it needs a wide appeal when ultimately it's really your past that lets your product stand out. And the only way to do that is to make it personal and actually put some of that stuff into it. Everyone listening to this should dedicate their first info product to their dog and they should include a picture of their dog in the introduction and boom. I mean, it'll be a hit. I guarantee you. On the cover. Put it on the cover even. Put it on the cover. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. I I like the idea. I mean, dedication used to be like for for this, right? To to make it a personal thing. And then the personality ends and then the book starts. (laughs) Right? It's like, oh yeah, this is a personal thing. Oh, this person has a partner and children? Interesting. Ignore. Let's start with the actual (laughs) interesting stuff. I think you're right. That the personal journey of every creator in their work is the interesting part. Yeah. Because where else would the knowledge and the insight come from if not from an experienced life? Right? And I guess that's also maybe answering a question that we didn't even ask. Like, how do I get to write an interesting info product? live an interesting life, like do experience things, like try stuff, fail at it, win at it, doesn't really matter. And then talk about that. Like the act alone of trying out things and learning about things is worth documenting and worth sharing with other people. So yeah. sources of inspiration are essentially everywhere in your present, in your, in your past, obviously, and in your not too distant future, the things you want to do. Right? You can you can use everything, all of these things for potential interesting info products. It's it's a perfect tie between making your audience, like we discussed last time, versus making a product. That mm-hmm. the the whole thing, how you build an audience, is is by being personal, by actually mm-hmm. showing yourself and your dog yeah. and maybe your baby <laughs> photos too, because it's 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 what people are going to connect with. We began this yeah. by talking about fish and chips and our opinions on fish and chips and then J- jamie asked about well what's what's a german breakfast and it the only reason he, he was asking and we were discussing that is because we had opinions on them based on our unique experience of life that's how the world goes around at the end of the day we connect with humans you've got to keep a bit of that humanity in the things that we do i think that's a good place to finish um and any final thoughts? I think we've provided them all, haven't we? <laughs> yeah, I'm going uh, to save if, a couple if, for next episode. If anybody uh, listening to this creates an info product that includes any baby photos or pictures of your pets, please send them to us. <laughs> uh, I'd love to see them, and I'll happily buy. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll make sure those are retweeted quite a bit, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll have some kind of YouTube video, Jamie, Arvid, and Craig reacts to baby photo creator <laughs> product. <laughs> Oh, so spicy. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Until next time, chaps. It's always a pleasure. No, it's fun. <laughs>